Going by the odds, Ernest Evans never should have become a naval officer. The son of a Cherokee mother and biracial father, Evans grew up in poverty in rural Oklahoma during the early 1900s. Despite enduring intense prejudice at his mostly white high school, Evans graduated in 1926 and joined the National Guard. He soon transferred to the Navy and served as an enlisted sailor, but Evans wanted to earn an officer's commission. Despite having no political connections, he applied to the Naval Academy at a time when it rarely admitted Native Americans. Evans did well enough on his entrance exam to win an appointment as a midshipman in the class of 1931. Ten years later, Lieutenant Evans was serving on destroyers when the United States entered World War II. On October 27, 1943, now Commander Evans took charge of USS Johnston, a Fletcher-class destroyer. His words to Johnston's crew that day foretold his determination to carry out his duty regardless of the personal cost. On October 20th, 1944, Johnston joined 7th Fleet's Task Unit 77.4.3, call sign Taffy 3 to defend the northern approach to Leyte Gulf, the site of a landing by American forces tasked with retaking the Philippines from the Japanese. Early in the morning of October 25th, a pilot reported that a powerful column of Japanese cruisers and battleships was steaming into Leyte Gulf, heading directly towards Johnston and its small escort carrier task unit. The Japanese force consisted of four battleships, including Yamato, one of the two heaviest and most powerfully armed battleships ever built. Accompanying them were six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers. To turn back this threat, Taffy 3 had just three destroyers, four destroyer escorts, and six small escort carriers. Yamato alone weighed more than all 13 of Taffy 3 ships combined. Despite being heavily outgunned, Evans gave the order to attack. Noticing that the Japanese were targeting the escort carrier Gambier Bay, Evans told his crew to fire on the nearest Japanese cruiser in order to draw its fire away from the carriers. This painting depicts the moment at approximately 7 a.m. when Japanese shells began falling around Johnston. I imagine at this moment, Evans may well have realized that on this day, and in this place, he was going to have to sacrifice his ship, and probably his own life, in order to save the U.S. fleet. Under a hail of Japanese fire, Johnston fired more than 200 rounds at the heavy cruiser Kumano. At the extreme range of about 5 miles, Johnston fired its full complement of 10 torpedoes. At least two of them hit Kumano and blew off the bow causing the ship to sink within minutes. The other American warships joined in as well, and the ferocity of their attack convinced the Japanese commander that he was actually facing a force of enemy cruisers. In combat, soldiers fighting on land can at least try to take cover behind terrain when the shooting starts. But when you're a sailor on a ship that's going into battle out on the open ocean, there's nowhere to hide. If a shell hits your ship, you just have to hope you're not standing in the wrong place. Despite Johnston's initial success, enemy shells struck it as well, causing widespread damage and casualties. Around 7.30, three six-inch shells fired from Yamato hit Johnston's bridge. Commander Evans was hit in the face and torso by shrapnel. His shirt was burned off his back, and he lost two fingers from his left hand. Ignoring his own injuries, and despite his ship's reduced speed and firepower, Evans kept Johnston in the engagement. The destroyer landed hits from its 5-inch guns on the 15,000-ton heavy cruiser Tone, as well as the 37,000-ton battleship Congo, before reversing back into the rain and smoke. At 8.40, a new threat appeared, when a column of Japanese destroyers approached to attack the escort carriers. Evans turned his ship around and charged out to meet them. 
One by one, Johnston took on the Japanese and forced most of them to break off their attack runs even as his own ship continued taking hits. By 9.20, forced from the bridge by exploding ammunition, Evans was commanding the ship from the stern by shouting orders down to men manually operating the rudder. Twenty minutes later, shellfire knocked out the remaining engine, leaving Johnston dead in the water. As the attackers gathered around the vulnerable ship, they concentrated fire on it rather than the fleeing carriers. Johnston was hit so many times that one survivor recalled they couldn't patch holes fast enough to keep her afloat. At 9.45 a.m., Evans gave the order to abandon ship, and 25 minutes later, the destroyer rolled over and sank. Of the crew of 327, only 141 survived. Of the 186 lost, about 50 were killed by enemy action. 45 died later from their battle injuries, and 92, including Evans, were alive in the water after Johnston sank, but were never seen again. Four other American ships were sunk that day, and seven were heavily damaged, resulting in the deaths of thousands of sailors. For its incredible act of self-sacrifice at Leyte Gulf, Taffy Three was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. For his own actions in keeping his ship fighting to the very last, Commander Ernest Evans posthumously received the Medal of Honor. Today, students enrolled in the Maritime Staff Operators course at the Naval War College continue to study the Battle of Leyte Gulf as part of their curriculum. The building where their classes meet is named Evans Hall. But perhaps the most fitting tribute to Commander Evans's bravery came not from the U.S. Navy, but from the Japanese. As Johnston rolled over and began to sink, a few survivors floating in the water watched as a Japanese destroyer approached. Its captain, upon seeing the wreckage up close, turned to the American ship and saluted.